Jewel Thief circuits have been around for quite some time. Most of them make use of a small toroidal ferrite core like this with a couple of coils wound onto them. You can get these out of compact fluorescence, just take one apart, mind the fact there's mercury in the bulb, so be a little careful. Rip this out, wind a couple of wires around it, that will do. Problem with that is it's a bit of a faff. Fortunately there are better ways of doing this, or at least easier ways of doing this, with just off the shelf components. So I'm going to show you how to put one together, and more importantly explain exactly how it works. This is pretty much all you need in terms of components, an inductor. 47 micro henrys is fine, you could go a bit higher, LED so you can see the output, a couple of resistors, 100k is ok, 10k if you want to run on slightly lower input voltage, but by using smaller resistors you do increase the current draw on the circuit, and a couple of switching transistors, I'm using a 557 PMP and a 547 NPN, could get away with a quad 2 and a 2907, they've got slightly higher current capacity plus lower gain, so they're perhaps a better choice for this circuit, but pretty much anything will do. If you want to go running something like these rainbow flashing LEDs, you're going to need to smooth the output. You can get away with a little bit of smoothing with a small capacitor such as a 10 nanofarad, but really for something like this you want a bit more capacity such as a 100 microfarad electrolytic, a 10 microfarad or a 220 microfarad will do just as well and all importantly you need a diode to just block the signal getting back into the main circuit pretty much anything will work, uh, I'm using a 4148 small signal diode a Schottky diode could be used, doesn't really matter to get the basic circuit up and running you only need this if you want to do something a little bit cleverer with it get a capacitor and a diode, throw that in and you get a nice stable output. Now before breadboarding our circuit it's always worth running a quick spice simulation to see what happens. This is our circuit diagram, we've got our PMP here and our MPN there. This is forming a kind of complementary Darlington configuration. We've got a voltage divider on the base and our inductor up here which is providing our time base for the circuit. I'm assuming it's going to run on 1.5 volts, it will run lower than that, but for the sake of this simulation we'll assume we've got a fresh AA cell. If you want to run on a lower voltage, you may need to increase this inductor and reduce the value of these resistors, but it's not too critical, this works okay down to about 1 volt. Now when the circuit switch is on, obviously the emitter of our PMP is connected directly to supply, so its base is going to be about a diode drop lower, this will be about 0.8 volts, and current is going to flow through our PMP into the base of our MPN and then down to ground. This is going to be on as well, therefore the voltage here is going to rise to about 0.7 volts, a diode drop above ground. Now once this transistor is switched on, it's going to try and pull its collector down to ground. So this point is going to be essentially at 0 volts. In fact, it will be slightly higher than that, about 50 to 100 microvolts above ground. But that basically means we've got 1.5 volts across our inductor when the circuit switch is on. Now, the rate of change of current through an inductor is proportional to the voltage. So if we've got a constant voltage across this inductor, we would expect a constant change of current running through it. And if we run the simulation and have a look, that's essentially what we get. Our current is ramping up to a maximum, about 160 milliamps in this simulation, and then suddenly it stops and drops. The rate of change of the current here is obviously very fast indeed, so we're going to get quite a high voltage as a result, and it's that higher voltage which essentially drives the output stage from one of these circuits. The question is, why does it suddenly switch at this point? And the answer is all to do with these transistors. Now as the current increases through our inductor, a little bit is going to be flowing through our voltage divider, but the bulk of it is going to flow through this MPN which of course is switched on. Now as we increase the current through our MPN, the collector voltage is going to rise. More current means a higher collector emitter voltage, and if we actually measure the voltage here and zoom in on this phase where it's charging up, we can see that indeed the voltage is going from a little, little bit below 0.1 volts up to about 0.4 volts, at which point it increases quite rapidly. And that has a consequence for what's going on over here. Basically, our PMP is trying to source current out of its base, PMP source current, which means they're going to go down through R2, but also up through R1 and down through Q2. So the current coming out of our base splits. But of course the voltage 
at our collector is increasing so that reduces the voltage across R1 and this basically means less current can flow through R1. The base voltage will change slightly to try and compensate for this but if it reduces the voltage it's going to reduce the current through here increase the current through there. If it increases the voltage it will increase the current through here but reduce it further through R1. So changing this voltage doesn't make a great deal of difference. Essentially we're squeezing the current that can come out through that base by increasing our collector voltage here. And if we measure the collector voltage here and the base voltage here you'll see that at about 23 milliseconds the two swap over. This ramping up here of the collector voltage far more than you might expect just from the current going through here well that's because we're starting to see a reduced current on our base that limits the current that can flow through it and limits the current that can go into our MPN and as we reduce the base current here the collector can't be brought all the way down to the emitter the transistor is finding it harder and harder to switch fully so once this starts once we start losing our base current here we're going to start losing our base current here and the whole thing feeds back on itself this voltage rises increasingly and that reduces the current through here increasingly until we get this point where there's a crossover at that point current is no longer flowing out through our base it's flowing down through R1 and into our base and if we measure the current at the base we can see starts off at about minus 10 milliamp microamp sorry uh, and then it starts to increase and at this point here it's gone above zero where's the zero here 23 microseconds just after that current has reversed direction it's no longer coming out it's going in and as soon as PMP switches off the MPN is going to switch off no more current can flow through our inductor and that's exactly what we see happening at this point here which is about 23 microseconds as soon as the current stops flowing the voltage increases and we get a very large voltage spike in this case we're getting about 18 volts and of course the circuit then resets and repeats over and over again if we tag an output stage onto this circuit we can see how we can stabilize the voltage simply by adding a diode and a capacitor this is our LED that we're going to be using to see what's actually going on if we look at the voltage here in the simulation look at the voltage there we're getting this same peaked output it's limited to about 2.7 volts now that's because we're feeding it in through our diode we only need about 2 volts here so we don't need 18 volts as soon as it gets above 2 volts it will start to conduct and that will reduce the voltage here if we look at the voltage here we are indeed getting a fairly stable output about 1.9 volts which is what the diode wants the voltage here, here is a little bit higher obviously because our diode is dropping some voltage we can reduce that by using a Schottky diode but it doesn't really make a lot of difference because we've got plenty of voltage over here as the voltage comes into here it's charging our capacitor as you can see and at this point here our capacitor starts to build up a little bit of charge and it's basically this which is then being used to drive our LED if we look at the current through our LED you can see that it starts to increase once this capacitor has begun charging at about 0.4 milliseconds. There's still a bit of ripple, we can improve on that by changing our capacitor. If I increase that to 100 microfarads, as we're going to be using on the breadboard, uh, I will probably need to change the time base as well because a larger capacitor will take longer to reach this point. So if I rerun the simulation, that's our voltage output at our LED and that's the current through our LED and as you can see it's a lot smoother than it was with just the 10 microfarad there and if I zoom in on the voltage trace you can see that the ripple there is just a few millivolts maybe about two to three millivolts so that's pretty smooth if we increase the capacitor here even further we could get that smoother still but the consequence is it's going to take a little bit longer before that LED lights up but once it has lit up it's nice and stable so that's essentially how the circuit works constant current through here, constantly rising voltage here, eventually that switches and puts current into our PMP which turns everything off, the current stops, the voltage spikes and the diode and capacitor basically store that voltage to continue powering the LED as the circuit is catching its breath and resetting. Now what we've got to do is build it on the breadboard and see if it works in practice. 
So this is our circuit on the breadboard. We've got our inductor up here, our voltage divider, our PMP transistor and our MPN transistor. I'm going to run this off a small power supply rather than a, an AA cell. This is using a 317 voltage regulator, so it won't go below 1.25 volts, which is the reference voltage, but it will run off a lower voltage if you've got an AA cell. But for now, I'll just use this. There is uh, no current limiting resistor on our LED, although the supply is saying 37 milliamps, not all of that is going into the LED. Most of it is actually being lost in our transistors. There's possibly about 10 milliamps going through our LED, which is more than enough to light it up without damaging it. As you can see on the oscilloscope trace, we are getting our pulsed output with a little bit of negative voltage over here. We can get rid of that simply by putting a small bypass capacitor, this is a 10 nanofarad capacitor, stick that across our LED and that gives us a nice stable trace. Still pulsed obviously, a little bit cleaner. Uh, trouble is this won't run one of these flashing LEDs. If I put the rainbow flashing LED in the circuit, you'll see that it tries, it does light up, but it's not cycling. The reason is we're switching it on and off. Because we're switching it on and off constantly, it's resetting, it's not going through its cycle. In order to get it cycling, we need to increase the capacitance with the blocking diode like we did on the SPICE simulation. So if I add a slightly larger, this is 100 microfarads, put that in there, the LED will initially go off because we're simply shuffling voltage into and out of our capacitor, it's coming back into that, the main circuit. In order to get rid of that, we simply need to block it off with the all-important diode. So if I add the diode and reconnect that, and our LED starts flashing as it should do. As you can see on the trace, we're getting a bit of a jumping about signal. It's fairly flat, but because this has got three different LEDs in, they're all running on different voltages, so the circuit is moving around quite a bit. But nevertheless, that is giving us sufficient stability that we can run a rainbow flashing LED fairly brightly off a 1.2 volt supply. If we go back to our green LED we can have a look at the trace with a little bit more detail. There, like that, And you can see that our voltage is pretty much a flat line. If we uh, increase our resolution slightly you can see that there are still some spikes on it but they're fairly small and they're probably down to about a millivolt but uh, that's not too bad we're getting a pretty stable voltage and of course if we had some circuitry here that required a higher voltage that wouldn't be a problem as long as we don't need more than about 10 milliamps this one will do it if we do need a bit more current you could use a higher value inductor and some lower value resistors you can probably get down to about 0.9 volts if we ramp this up slightly to the 1.5 nominal current has gone up a little bit that's more than enough to be powering some downstream circuitry and obviously the whole thing will run off a single AA cell with just a handful of components to do the job. So there you go, that's how you build a DC boost converter.